have a new title, I haven't memorized it yet. Senior Principal Community Architect, which is a big long way of saying, I think I know stuff about community. Um, I work on the open source and standards team at Red Hat. Our job um, within Red Hat and also with um, outside of Red Hat is to try to foster community um, health, uh, development, and growth, um, primarily around the open source upstream uh, versions of our commercial offerings. But we also do a lot of uh, collabor collaborative work with uh, communi other communities inside of Red Hat and also outside of Red Hat. So we're trying to be as helpful um, and with our expertise as possible. I work with a fantastic team of people, some of whom are here today um, or have been on our team, um, and they are, are amazingly smart people, especially since they conned me into doing this talk. So we'll see. All right. So I want to talk a little bit, and this may be a, a recurring theme for uh, us today. I've heard this coming up a couple of times. But I want to kind of talk about how beautiful things are, but also how harmful they can be. Now, this kind of relates to what we do around metrics and metrics analysis. But I wanted to kind of walk through a couple of analogies that we find in nature. So hello to the blue dragon. This is a delightful animal, very beautiful. And I, I actually think the picture doesn't even do it justice. This is a three centimeter sea slug, also known as a snow angel. It's beautiful, it's so pretty. So yeah, but except it eats Portuguese man of war jellyfish and then it stores the poison in its spine. So if you touch this thing, you're going to be in severe pain or, you know, dead. So. Didn't know you were going to get a safety tip today, too. So avoid the, the, the sea dragon. Another beautiful thing, and those of you who've read the oatmeal might be familiar with this little creature. This is the mantis shrimp, which is a pretty large 15 to 30 centimeter um, shrimp, which, you know, it can see more colors than any other animal. Human beings have three um, uh, color cones in their eyes. Is it rods or cones? Both. Yeah, okay, that. But we can see three colors, RGB, and then you, you kind of combine. They have 16 uh, different ones. Oh, yeah. But the other thing about this thing is those two front claws can they, they accelerate them at speeds greater than a rifle gunshot, which can deliver 1,500 newtons of force. They can't keep these things in aquariums because they will break the glass just with the force they don't even touch the glass. The force of the water hitting the glass can break the glass. Not to mention they also kill every other animal in the, in the tank with them. And for more information, in a delightfully funny way, if you've not read the Oatmeal comic, it is certainly there. And the link will be on the slides out, in the, out on the, the chaos site. And as we all know, because I sense you are like me, we are all data nerds here. We like data. Data is pretty. Just like the mantis shrimp. Yeah, my wife, she didn't know what to do with me at all. So, yeah, I'm the guy that likes the spreadsheet kind of things. And, well, let's make a chart. Go. That's what we're here for. We're here to look at data. And we find patterns in data. We find beauty in data. But sometimes that always doesn't work out terribly well. And, and the, the, what brought me here today was actually a conversation that I have with the people at Baturgia. Now, before I get going with this, let me just put out the official disclaimer. I like them, and they like me. And if anybody has a problem with what I'm about to say, I'll remind them that Daniel invited me to do this talk on this topic. <laughs> yeah, the boy's not dumb. So sometimes I know. Okay, but let's talk about beautiful data because we see it all the time. And, and, uh, and very much alas, this isn't going to really show very well. Um, it might show a little bit better on the, on the slides that you see and, and definitely find the link to this. This is some really great data out here. This one I love because this is an informational uh, data showing like how er much earlier 
the East, so Middle Eastern uh, cultures in and around Persia and Iran and Saudi Arabia were discovering things like, oh, that the sun was the center of the solar system. They did that in 611, and unfortunately, this got cut off, but I think that was, it was 1500 and something before the Europeans figured that out. You know, this is telling a story. This is basically saying that any time you believe one culture is superior and advanced to another, you might want to check that at the door, okay? Because usually somebody else has figured it out. And I love that story. And I encourage you to go look at this graphic because it's kind of cool um, and not as fuzzy as this. And then here's one that we all love. This is a nice big informational thing about all the data breaches that have happened um, in the last uh, few years and how many user accounts have been thrown out into the wild. And again, you know, there's a lot more information at the actual URL. So I encourage you to go look at that. Um, that, that just makes me sad and nervous. And the introvert part of me is like, yes, I am right to stay home and not talk to anybody, you know, because my, I don't want my data out there. Um, so again, it's telling a story. Is it the right story? Because all kidding aside, you know, yeah, that's a lot of hacks and that's a lot of data floating around in there. But you can take two things with this. You can say, well, I just have to be more careful with my data. Or another path might be, oh my God, the sky is falling. You know, I want to get myself off the internet in all you know, possible ways. And any other path in between. So it's a lot more than two, actually. It's telling a story. You can draw your own conclusions. Okay? And that's what all data really does. You present data. You're trying to tell a story. Will your audience accept that story? You hope. Um, but maybe not. I'm hoping you accept the story that I'm telling you now. When we get to Q&A at the end of this, you might be like, you oh, know, you're an idiot. And then I've got to kind of tell a new story. Or we have to work out a new story together. That's part of dialogue. That's part of how this works. But I want to kind of back that up a little bit. And let's talk about community and metrics. Because it's not always helpful. You can have all the data in the world but sometimes it just isn't very, going to be very helpful to you. And it can actually be, in some respects, harmful. Like I said before, this could be helpful. This could help you figure out a strategy for managing your online presence. It could be harmful because it could drive people to panic and worry about things and create a lot of friction around commerce and e-commerce when really what we need to be doing is finding solutions. So this is a clear example how data can be helpful and harmful depending on what story is getting told. So we're all familiar with Paturgy, and again, I, my graphics for this went kooky netty. Um, but we've seen enough Paturgy dashboards already today. We know what this looks like. This is actually an active one that we have um, in Red Hat, not specifically within my OSAS team. This is what the OpenShift um, project uses. OpenShift is a Kubernetes-based distribution um, that manages containers and does a lot of platform as a service kinds of work. And I really shortened that down, but they're not here, so I can get away with that. They actually use this still on a daily basis. And, and we know how this works, and we know if you're not familiar Baturgia does a very good job of presenting data in a very informative and clean way. Ray had excellent examples of how he could, could do you know, surveys on that and, and, and figure out what was going on in his community. But let me tell you a story. We have approximately, well, when the story started, we had approximately 10 active communities that we were managing and open source and standards. We really wanted to get some kind of look about how healthy our communities were. Not just from the pure, um, purely uh, theoretical aspect of, yes, we need to make sure communities are healthy, but there's also a business side of this too. You know, Red Hat is a business. We have to make things work well and efficiently, okay? We're not robots, but by the same token, we just can't spend money 
willy-nilly and hope that, you know, solutions are presented. Okay. So metrics were seen as a way of figuring out how our communities were and what their status were and if there were problems, we could find them. And actually, right before I came on board with Red Hat, this, we, um, my team had started discussions with Paturgia. And then when I came on board, my manager was leading those discussions. I would tag along with meetings with him. And, and eventually, when he moved to another part of the company, I sort of took over the, the, the contact person. And we had a great relationship with Paturgia. And they built us beautiful dashboards. They were gorgeous. I was working um, on one project then called Overt. And Overt, we had a great dashboard and I was using it kind of, sort of, and making it work. But did you hear the kind of, sort of in there? <coughs> this is the part of the problem. Because as much of a data geek that I am, and basically, I would really describe myself as a very talented amateur or with data. I'm not a data scientist in any way, shape, or form. I was having trouble finding actionable items out of this data. And we used to have conversations. And I know, and I'm sorry, by the way, this is my public apology. I know I was driving these people crazy uh, because I was like, they're like, well, what's wrong? And I'm like, I don't know. But, you know, I'm not really getting a lot of value out of this. And he's like, well, is something broken? And yeah, Jesus was, I think he's about ready to throw a shoe at me. Um, <laughs> and I'm probably too close now. So it's all good. But it's one of those things, it's like, I couldn't figure out what was, working, what was not working about this. And made it worse, my colleagues, and again, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, okay? They weren't really getting this either. And these are talented, smart people. And, and, and they're very good at what they do. But they weren't understanding, like, you know, they, well, no, let me back that up. They weren't interested in using the Paturgia dashboard to glean out information about their community health. And we used to have meetings about this constantly. Well, what, what's wrong? Why, what? It's hard to find what I'm looking for in here. Well, how can we help you find what you're looking for? Well, I don't have enough time to do this. You know, I've got other things I have to do. I've got daily things like I have to manage events. I have to manage social media accounts. I have to, you know, I have to get contributors in line because they're having a fight over on this mailing list. You know, there are a lot of different reasons and daily life seem to be pushing this out. And so, you know, we had two ways of doing this. One, we could just blame Paturgia and say, ah, no, this sucks, we're done. Uh, we did not, okay, <laughs> and I'm not doing it now either. Or we could be honest with ourselves and say, the problem was really as simple as the old Douglas Adams adage from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. What is the answer to life, the universe, and everything? What's the question? Exactly. So I'm not really giving you anything new here, but that was the problem. We didn't know what questions we needed to ask. We had a vague idea, like, Mailing lists growing in traffic, and that graph is moving up and to the right, that was good. But what did it mean? It could mean that you're getting more users, and you've got a lot more questions and answers. It could also mean you have a troll on your mailing list who's starting fights every five seconds, and everybody's jumping on them to, to do the arguments. Which one's a healthy community? The numbers weren't clear because we weren't delving into what, what was going on beyond just the most superficial level. And that became our problem. And we learned very quickly that these dashboards, as very well presented and as personable as they were, were not really helping us find the answers that we sought because we, as a team, did not know the right questions. So with regret, we kind of eased up a little bit. We said, look, we can't, we don't really want to 
you know, we can't really justify working with you guys when we don't know what we're doing. We haven't figured this out. And, and it, the, the information is not going to be used. So we eased up in our relationship with Paterja, at least on a commercial level. We still have a very good social and, you know, um, academic relationship with Paterja, which I'm, you know, they invited me here, so I'm pretty sure it's still continuing. Um, but, you know, we kind of eased up. OpenShift is the exception. OpenShift said, oh no, don't, don't put that away, I want that. Because that community manager, whose name is Diane Mueller, if you're familiar with her, Diane Mueller knew what to do with this. She found the use in the dashboard. She was getting the stories she needed. And I would talk to Diane a lot and say, well, what are you doing? How can I get that to translate? And some of it was translatable, and then some of it wasn't. Some of it was very specific to her community. So, and we still had the problem where we had friction in my team and they were like, why do we need to do this? That, that's OpenShift's thing. I don't have that kind of community. What kind of saved us was really Project Chaos. And I'm not going to repeat what Project Chaos is here because I think we all know what Project Chaos is here. But that saved us because more than anything else, that started laying the, the, the groundwork for questions to be asked. And now we're starting to, as a team, revisit the notion of metrics with the idea of we have certain questions that we want to be answered. Um, a, a, a colleague here that recently gave us a wonderful um, internal presentation at Red Hat that he's probably going to do out in the real world someday. And, and Gregory basically looked at his mailing list data and was concluding that maybe his mailing list was not being used as much as it should be. And I know I'm shorthanding your own talk. Sorry, um, I'll give you 20 euros later. Um, but, but his conclusion was that perhaps we should move to another messaging platform. But, and, and they did, and I'm, that's all I'm going to say because he has a much more detailed and wonderful uh, look at this. And if you have any questions about it, I would uh, definitely go ask him later. But we, fe we found that instead of looking at a giant picture, what we needed to be doing was looking at, looking at individual pieces of our communities and seeing if there were problems there to be solved. And that is really the story that I wanted to tell you. Not that, you know, but Biturgia did something wrong or that metrics dashboards are the wrong thing to use. They're great, but you can't just go in them and, ex and, and expect to see the answers just fly out in your face. You have to be ready to ask the questions. We have to be scientists. It's, it's not really a question of running with your gut anymore, which is what community managers have been doing for quite some time. We have to be able to define questions, test those questions as hypotheses, and see if that's the, if that's the conclusion. And if it's not the conclusion, don't reject it, work with it. This is what we should be doing. And, this is why I believe if you get two things out of this, one is that you know, questions are going to be critical. You have to understand you know, what, it is, you know, what it is that marks a healthy community, and that's where Project Chaos can come in and help you. Um, you have to be able to codify your questions instead of saying, you know, why is my mailing list you know, growing in size? Maybe you should narrow that down. You know, um, are there maybe, what, what's the content of your traffic? Maybe if you're lucky, you can do some semantic analysis. You know, run some, run some of that. And are there loaded words in there? Are there people using language that probably wouldn't be considered civil? You know, that might mean the aggressive state of your mailing list is a little high. And maybe you do have a troll problem, you know. Because we're, you know, unless you've got a really small community, you're not going to be able to read every message all the time. 
you know, I dare somebody to go off to the Kubernetes, you know, mailing list and try to figure those out. <laughs> you know, and, and Kubernetes is cool, but they're big, you know. So you've got to be able to kind of figure out what might be happening with your community. And, and don't be afraid to ask dumb questions. That's another thing that people do. Well, my community's fine. We've been around for, you know, X amount of years and everything's going great. And there's really, you know, I don't have any problems in this area. No, 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 no. Okay. Probably, I, if that's really the case, more power to you. But don't be afraid to ask the obvious questions. You know, is the sky, you know, um, no, no, nope, bad metaphor. We're moving on. So don't... <laughs> No, that's, that's me trying to make a joke and like, no, we're done. That's not going to be funny. We're pulling it back. So questions are critical, and the answers have to tell stories. Now, I want to be very careful here because this is my journalism background coming. In journalism, we tell stories. By, there is no such thing as an unbiased journalist, okay? Because I'm a human being locked in my shell. I'm going to tell a story the way I'm telling it. I'm basing it on my own experiences, my own language, my own metaphors, my own cultural, our shared cultural um, values and, and, and language, so to speak. That's how stories are told. Okay? You have to be ready, but it's okay. Tell the story anyway. It, people will, may not agree with you. You know, but if you tell, if the data that you're looking at will tell you a story and you can put that story out there, now it becomes open for collaboration. Now it becomes open for um, comment and query and more questions, which is the magical, magical thing. Okay? Because anytime a story raises more questions than it answers, to me, that's great. That you've done a good job. There is a little bit of this here. You should know your audience. I'm telling you stories about data. I'm not in here telling you stories about football or anything like that because maybe you don't care because I know my audience. If you do, come see me later. Um, <laughs> but I know my audience. And that doesn't mean placate your audience. I want to be very careful there. I don't want you to tell a story that makes you always look good. You know? I, but I've got to tell a story to my managers. I really don't want to tell them that I dropped the ball on X. Well, maybe I have to tell that story because maybe you need help and you didn't realize it. Or maybe there's something you're not clicking with. You don't have the right experience. We're all you know, afraid of you know, being, uh, being affected by imposter syndrome, but by the same token, we have to be honest with ourselves and say, these are the things that I know I can do and these are the things I know I can't and where I get help. So answers should tell stories. And if you keep that in mind, I think your experience with metrics will be much better. So with that, thank you. That is me on, online when I'm not afraid of data breaches. Um, so are there any questions? We've got five minutes. Yes, sir. Are you going to throw a shoe at me? <laughs> thank you very much for your presentation. Okay. Uh, I have to say that you're completely right. I mean, data is data. If you don't have questions, and if you don't know, you know what to do with the data, what do you want the data for? The data is not nonsense, so it doesn't make any sense at all. And, uh, okay, I can get so out of here. I completely agree with you. So the problem is finding out how the data can be useful. And now moving to my brain, this uh, afternoon we are going to talk in the, in the working group for DMT exactly with that, because we are trying to figure out how to make metrics useful for people. And we have like two different things, in part learning from your experience. One is use cases. So what is people using metrics for? Whatever, as you said, maybe them, maybe pretty, pretty smart, maybe whatever. So what are people using metrics for? And the second one is try to group those experiences into areas so that you can find the human terms that most people are interested in. So that's what we are trying to do in the uh, DMD working group in Cairns. So if you want to come this afternoon to the tutorial, and we can talk about that. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. What he said. So that's good. Yeah, and what you would call um, use cases, that's kind of what I'm calling stories. Yeah. 
basically the same thing. We're constructing a model, you know, a, a use case, a story, something that displays what we're trying to uh, convey. So same thing. Any other questions or comments? Oh, but yes. Just to bring some more context about the OpenSync case, mm -hmm. um, is that uh, Diane, is, I would say, she's happy about the work we are doing together because she has exactly what you said, stories. Um, indeed, the presentation we had last week at TEPCOM mm -hmm. was about uh, personas. So we were presenting specific use cases uh, right. where she was uh, dealing with certain people or organizations. Right. To say, we are doing this in the right direction because these people here or this organization is and, and I thank you for reminding me about that. I, I did not get a chance to attend that talk, but I will tell you that all the talks uh, at, at that conference he mentioned, devconf.cz. Um, if you go there, uh, they are putting the recordings up, um, eventually the recording for Diane. Uh, Diane's and, and Daniel's talk will be online. So I invite you to go check that out. And you will learn more about how they're getting good stories out of OpenShift. Because again, this is not me trying to slam a dashboard. I'm just saying that if you don't know what you're doing, it's like you just basically put somebody who just got off a tricycle into a Ferrari, and they, you know, they're going to have a little problem getting from point A to point B. That's basically what we're talking about here. Uh, dev, D E V C O N F, devconf dot C Z for Czech Republic. And the videos will be up there somewhere.